Hello and welcome back to this series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of the Divine Comedy. Today we're going to try and make as much sense as possible of uh, Canto 32 of Purgatorio, which is not easy. It's a canto that has a neutron star density and I've been trying to understand it as much as possible thanks to uh, a little bit of a deepening of the revelation, John's revelation and Apocalypse, because that's where Dante is sourcing a lot of these images and a lot of it, of these ideas. But I think what happens, what can be, really be very useful in approaching Canto 32 is to step back for a second because Dante has already thrown at us a lot of these images, this type of style, uh, heavily allegorical and heavily symbolic, uh, uh, was in fact a literal style that had uh, become somewhat popular in the Jewish, in some Jewish communities even before Christ. And, and then it continued a little bit after in the first and second century uh, AD. And in this case, uh, Dante is really rereading and reinterpreting John's Apocalypse that's been, uh, that, that is the last book of the Bible, the, the Christian Bible, the very final book is John's uh, Revelation, Apocalypse, and that has been written, according to the scholars, around the end of the first century, so around 80 or 90 AD. So if we step back for a second and uh, look at this uh, incredible series of images that we have in front of us, we are still in Eden, the Garden of Eden, and uh, all this procession full of elements has been organized for Dante's benefit, so that Dante can see it. This is the purpose of this procession, uh, by the divine will. And what the procession represents, what we are actually looking at through Dante's eyes, is an allegory, uh, a symbol, a uh, representation of uh, the revelation in history. Well, basically, uh, an interpretation of uh, history as moved and as guided by the divine providence and ultimately uh, by God. So what Dante has done, he's gone from the macro view of universal history to his own micro history, his personal history with Beatrice. And now in Canto 32, he's going back to the macroscopic view and the universal one, because the relationship, the meeting with Beatrice has finally happened. The narration starts again at the beginning of Canto 32 with uh, this moment that is so crucial of uh, Dante's eyes finally meeting with Beatrice's eyes. Now here, we begin this canto with Dante who is lost in the biggest beauty, in the highest beauty that he could imagine, which is uh, Beatrice's face. Uh, and the last time that uh, he saw it, he saw her face, was, as most people think, in 1290 when, when she died. And we are here in 1300. He starts by saying in Italian, Tante eran gli occhi miei fissi e attenti. Fissi e attenti. My eyes were fixed and also very attentive. A disbramarsi la decenne sete. Decenne means uh, coming from a decade of thirst, his eyes. Che gli altri sensi meran tutti spenti. Ed essi quinci e quindi avie in parete di non caler Così lo santo riso a sé traeli con l'antica rete. Lo santo riso is the most beautiful part of, of, of these two tercets because it's the first time that Dante describes for us the holy smile of Beatrice. He's telling us that she is smiling at him with love and, uh, and that reminds him so much the physical beauty of her uh, when she was alive on earth that he cannot turn away. She is uh, capturing his eyes con l'antica rete, with the ancient net, the same net that captured his eyes during the real life. E lo santo riso, the, the holy smile. Riso, in fact, uh, in Italian, means laughter, but definitely here Dante means a, a smile, a gentle smile, a holy smile. And at this point, um, he is called to attention by one of these three uh, women or three girls. E la disposizione ca veder è negli occhi pur teste dal sol percossi, senza la vista alquanto 
Esser mi fe, the light that is hitting um, Beatrice's face is more intense and stronger than anything else around. In other words, uh, Beatrice, is, is, Beatrice is the only one who is uh, being enlightened by, by the Son of God directly. Uh, everything else is uh, in, the, in the light of the Garden of Eden. And here we can easily split Canto 32 in two parts, two parts of this uh, second part of the allegory, where in the first part uh, Dante is describing human history uh, pre-Christ, and the second part is describing human history after Christ with some specifications. My personal view of this, uh, of this canto, uh, almost from uh, the feelings that it generates in me, is almost like a, a roller coaster. A roller coaster because the first part, until maybe verse 105, 106, is slower and it kind of climbs up to a certain level of tension. So it reminds me of this roller coaster ascending, climbing up, climbing up to the peak point. And then um, there is this precipitation after verse uh, 106, where all these uh, incredible images very quickly and very terribly are thrown at us, uh, one after the other, after the other, the dragon, the monster, and this and that, the, the, the foxes. And if we, if we don't know where they come from, it's a kaleidoscope with, with no real sense. If we really want to understand um, where Dante is coming from and what Dante was reading and studying uh, when he was crafting and creating this Canto 32 and in fact all these last uh, five cantos of Purgatorio, there is a little bit uh, that we have to research and understand about John's Revelation, the final book of the Bible. Three main points. The first one, the fundamental point of all the apocalyptic literature and uh, of Revelation, but not only this one, but other works of literature that were in the same genre in the centuries before Christ and a couple of centuries after, is that God has a precise structured plan for man's history. And this uh, plan plans out completely entirely from creation until the last judgment the second coming of Jesus. The second point is that this historic vision and this reference to history is not only the history of a people, of only the Jewish people. The apocalyptic literature, even if it generated from the Jewish communities, offers us a vision that is total of the global history of man. So it's very universal. Within this universal history, the Jewish people are still the elected people. And finally, number three, Apocalypse is not, or Revelation, is not exactly like prophecy. A prophecy is more specific. Uh, a prophecy talks about uh, God and the relation of man with God, but in a specific moment in history with some specific locations or people it's in time. Uh, while Apocalypse is showing us the relationship of God with the entire creation and with the entire history. This is why we can understand um, why Dante liked it so much, because Dante's mind was a synthesizer. He's the great uh, compactor, he's the great synthesizer. He, he, after all, started the Convivio to write a huge encyclopedia and then transformed it into the Divine Comedy. So we always need to keep that in mind. What better opportunity than to write in a, in a style that was meant to synthesize all of human history. So we're slowly passing through the tall woods, empty because of one who had believed the serpent. I like how uh, Mandelbaum here has cut off Dante's misogyny. I, it makes me smile because uh, it's the second time in uh, only a few cantos that Dante takes a stab at Eve, of Adam and Eve, uh, by saying, oh, it's her fault if, uh, uh, you know, we are in the situation where we are, we cannot live in Eden because of Eve, which we know was a very common stereotype of his time. So we tend to try and forgive Dante for this misogyny. However, um, like I briefly mentioned in uh, one of my 
previous recent uh, videos, I think for Canto 30 or maybe 29, there is uh, something important to be said about uh, Genesis, the scenes um, described in Genesis about the Garden of Eve. Because even if in the Middle Ages, yes, there was this uh, negative stereotype, there was a lot of misogyny that informed uh, the interpretation of the scriptures. In fact, not many ancient books like the Genesis teach us that men and women are really equal. There is a, a very strong focus on men and women equality uh, in between the lines of Genesis. At verse uh, 2, 18, Genesis says, I will make him a helper as his partner. This helper word in the original Hebrew is a word that um, I don't know how to pronounce, but maybe uh, my friend Ursula can help me pronounce it. It's uh, Ezer, I believe, that can be translated as a helper, but a helper who is equal at the same level. A word that in the scripture is also used to qualify God as Ezer, so Ezer as a helper. So if it's a word, it's, not, it's an adjective that is used to qualify God, it's certainly not used in a negative way to qualify Eve. And there is one of the first uh, indicators that Genesis is really looking at men and women as equals on the same level. Second, and even more important, I believe, in uh, proving and demonstrating the fact that Genesis is not misogynistic, is the fact that in the actual sin committed of Eve, uh, picking the apple, eating the apple, and then offering it to Adam, etc., etc., in that dynamic, there are many details that show us that Eve has stronger qualities and better qualities in her personality than Adam himself. Saint Irenaeus wrote about the Genesis. He said, the serpent did not attack Eve based on her weakness, because she was weaker. That's not the reason why he attacked her. She showed that she was the stronger one between her and Adam. She alone stood up to the serpent, first of all, because Adam didn't, st didn't stand up to anybody. As soon as Eve went to him, he just went straight and ate the apple. Um, she ate only with resistance, with dissent. She didn't do immediately what the serpent was telling her to do. She resisted first and she was dissenting. And, and only after being dealt with in a very perfidious way by the serpent. While on the other hand, Adam ate the apple without any fight or without any word of contradiction. And Dante takes us straight back to these passages of Genesis after verse 34, 35, when he uh, talks about uh, Adam and he talks about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Here it's just incredible how um, he heard some murmurs and these very soft murmurs are saying, Adamo, Adamo. This is the name of Adam whispered, reprimanding, and maybe also as um, regret. So, poi cerchiaro una pianta dispogliata. Pianta is a plant, but really it, meant, it means a tree here. And this is literally the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Una pianta dispogliata di foglie ed altra fronda in ciascun ramo. Dante is very specific, very, very detailed here in telling us that this plant, this tree, has nothing on it. It doesn't have any leaves. It's just the... Uh, uh, dried up because the after the, the original sin it was dried up in fact i think there was a, a middle ages legend about this and he reports it here a uh, portion here that i love in italian is after verse uh, 43 where dante says there is a, a a voice and the voice says beato se griffon che non discindi col becco desto legno dolce al gusto, poscia che mal si torce il ventre, quindi. Mandelbaum translates, uh, Blessed are you, whose beak does not, O griffin, pluck the sweet-tasting fruit that is forbidden, and then afflicts the belly that has eaten. The fruit is uh, not digestible, and uh, blessed are you, griffin, because he is explaining that the griffin symbolizes 
Jesus Christ, who is without sin, and therefore he never tasted the fruit of sin. Now, here is not very easy, because Dante um, has the griefing talk. Jesus Christ says a sentence at verse 47, and he says, Thus is the seed of every righteous man preserved. This is Mandelbaum translation. In Italian is si si conserva il seme d'ogni giusto. Now, Mandelbaum does something in his translation that changes the sense uh, that some scholars um, read this, this sentence um, in, which is, so you preserve the, the seed of every other type of justice. This is how many read this sentence. The seed of every type of justice is not the seed of every righteous man, but the seed of every type of justice. It could be human law, it could be any type of legal system or justice that derives as a ramification from divine justice. And I would tend to prefer this type of interpretation, in fact. This is what uh, the sentence that Jesus says means. Another difficult passage is only a few verses later, where Dante says, E quel di lei, a lei lasciò legato. We see the chariot uh, approaching the tree. E voltò al temo che li aveva tirato. The griffin is uh, bringing the chariot very close to the tree, and then he drew it to the foot, and with the branch of that tree, tied the two together. Here the allegory finds its own uh, completion, because not only the chariot tied to the tree is the church linked to the history or original scene and uh, con contributing to a single narration, but also the church is the presence of Jesus Christ uh, on earth, and with the revelation, with the incarnation of God in Jesus, um, at this point, the entire tree, which is visually amazing, visually really beautiful, the entire tree blooms in uh, a spectacle of flowers, of colorful flowers. Mandelbaum says, uh, showing a tint that was less than rose and more than violet. Literally what uh, Dante says, men che di rose e più che di viole. So we should imagine this as uh, maybe purple, and this is what I've read many scholars say, the color purple is the color of these flowers that also has a very strong symbolic, Christian symbolic um, meaning, which is the blood of Christ. Through the sacrifice of Christ, the tree of knowledge has regained life and comes back to life. Right after this, Dante decides to use one of his uh, favorite literary strategies or tricks we can say, which is to fall asleep. He falls asleep if he hears some beautiful music, a beautiful singing, but uh, he is uh, really almost fainting and falling asleep. This allows him for a transition to the, a gradual transition to the second part of this canto. And it's actually Matilda who, on verse 72, tries to wake him up. She says, uh, Surgi, che fai? Rise up, what, what are you doing? Here he uses an example from the Gospel, uh, even as Peter, John and James. This example is uh, the so-called scene of the transfiguration of Jesus, where he uh, called uh, uh, three of his apostles, Peter, John and James, asked them to follow him on Mount Tabor to see um, what the transfiguration was an anticipation of the glory of Christ, and therefore he showed himself uh, in his divine nature, uh, resplendent light, all white, different type of uh, white clothes, etc., uh, until they also fell asleep, and then as soon as they woke up again, they saw him dressed normally, regularly, like he was before. It's not very easy to understand here, because Dante uses the word melo, which is apple tree, to indicate Jesus in this scene at verse 74, the blossoms of the apple tree. As Dante wakes up, the very first thing that he does as soon as he wakes up and he's, he has uh, Matilda next to him, uh, almost uh, comically, 
the first thing that he asks is, where is Beatrice? Where is, dove, dove è Beatrice? I, I want to see her again. He's almost addicted to her. Onde la vedi lei sotto la fronda nuova sedere in sulla la sua radice. Beatrice has dismounted the chariot and she's sitting peacefully under the tree. At this point, almost the entire procession has left following the griffin. They've gone up in the sky following back where they came. And the only elements that are, are left here surrounding Beatrice are only the seven virtues, the seven women representing the seven virtues, the four cardinal virtues and the three theological virtues, plus the chariot that is still there, and the seven lamps. The seven lamps that still represent the spirit, the divine spirit, and therefore ultimately God. We come here to the center of the canto and the, the most important terzine, tercets, these two tercets from verse 100 to 105. They are the central and most important because these are, this is the investiture that Beatrice is giving to Dante. And uh, in a certain sense, this is the reason why all of this uh, allegorical scene has been performed in front of Dante. Because on one hand, the apocalyptic vision is talking about the universal history, yes, but on the other, it's talking about the personal individual history of Dante and what's uh, the most important role that Dante plays in his personal history related to universal history is his role in writing the Divine Comedy as not only a simple man, but an actual prophet, as somebody who has been dictated the words of the Divine Comedy by God. Beatrice, for the first time in the comedy here, is... Uh, making this official for us. And she's saying, here you shall be a while a visitor in your pilgrimage, but you shall be with me in the future, in your eternal life, and without end, Rome's citizen, the Rome in which Christ is Roman, in Paradiso, in heaven. And thus to profit the world, which lives badly, which is us mortals on, on earth, watch the chariot steadfastly, and when you have returned beyond, transcribe what you have seen. Transcribe what you have seen. This is the entire point. This is the role that Dante takes on his shoulders from Beatrice. Beatrice tells him to do this. So, ritornato di là, fa che tu scrive. Ritornato di là, once you come back there, fa che tu scrive. Make sure, make sure that you write, scrive. For a second time, St. Peter will uh, say this concept again to Dante in uh, Paradiso Canto 27. But this actually reminds us that the Divine Comedy is about our happiness. It's not about as much the afterlife or a description of the afterlife. The Divine Comedy is what Dante was saying to Cangrande in his famous letter to Cangrande, where he said the goal, the main goal of this work is to free men, human beings, in this life, um, of their state of unhappiness and to guide them to a state of happiness. This is fundamental because there are, there are so many things and elements in the Divine Comedy. Sometimes we lose sight of what the main goal was. The, the, the main goal and the main thing that really Dante is talking about, even sometimes uh, I would say, if you look at it from a non-religious point of view, from a non-Christian point of view, even more universal than religion, is human happiness. Here we have reached the peak, the top of the roller coaster, and uh, from now on it's gonna be very, very fast and uh, incredibly full of images. Um, this is the second part of the allegory that um, is, is described in this canto, and it starts from uh, verse 106. We are looking at the history post-Christ, after uh, the coming of Christ. Therefore, Dante describes with uh, apocalyptic allegories and visions the four main crises that uh, shook the Church since uh, its inception and since its uh, foundation by Jesus Christ. These four main crises are, number one, the persecutions, described as uh, the bird of Jove, that the, the, there was an eagle because it was sacred to Job, the eagle, and that represents the empire. The persecutions were made and uh, brought 
by the empire, by the Roman Empire. The second great crisis was the heresies, and the heresies are represented by the fox. A uh, fox that seemed to lack all honest nourishment, uh, even if it tried to hide in the triumphal chariot. So the foxes are the heresies. Even in St. Augustine, uh, heresies are figuratively shown as foxes. The third big one is uh, this uh, at verse uh, 125 and 126. Dante is showing the eagle that is coming down to the chariot and leaving some of its uh, plumage. These feathers that the eagle leaves here are to symbolize the temporal power that uh, the church was given by Constantine, allegedly with the famous donation of Constantine, where uh, people were convinced in Dante's times that Constantine had signed a contract by which he was giving a big amount of lands and uh, assets and temporal goods to the church. This document has been later um, clarified and discovered as a forgery, so nothing so basically the donation of Constantine is a forgery, it never really happens, but happened. But the point remains, the church gained more and more temporal power, and this in itself, uh, from Dante's point of view, and from any good Christian point of view, is a crisis, is a problem, because it should not have happened. And finally, fourth big crisis, the dragon. This dragon is, a, is an animal, is a beast that we are not used to seeing in the Divine Comedy. Maybe Gerion was kind of dragon-like, but not really. Here, the earth opens up, a dragon emerged, and it drove its tail up through the chariot, splitting the chariot. This is the seismic event that, once again, based on a mistake, uh, on a historic mistake, um, Dante, like many others, or everybody in his times, believed that uh, there was a schism that uh, had been brought by Mohammed, who used to be a Rome cardinal, but then separated out and divided, split the church. Uh, in, in this type of schism was wanted by Satan. The type of image of the dragon is also present in the Apocalypse and uh, is, pers is, is basically Satan personified. Now, it's still like the previous one, it's based on a historic mistake, but it's also still valid if we think about the, the problems and the big blow to the church and to the history of the church that a big schism uh, has brought upon. We moderns can think about the Protestant Reformation, which probably in terms of size and the entity of the, of the crisis was even bigger than what Dante imagined as brought forth by Mohammed. So these are the four big crises exemplified in this uh, mayhem of monsters and images. Finally, we get to the strongest image that closes the entire canto, which is the puttana. <laughs> he says, uh, uh, Sicura quasi rocca in alto monte seder sovresso una puttana sciolta. First of all, puttana in Italian, modern Italian, is a really bad word. It's a, a swear word that you should never use in, in, in good company. Uh, so it's a, it's a very stark and strong word that we are almost surprised to find at this level of the Divine Comedy in Canto 32 of Purgatorium. In uh, John's Apocalypse, in fact, there is a prostitute as well. So Dante is simply sourcing and re-elaborating what he's been studying and reading in the Apocalypse. In John, the, this uh, prostitute is representing imperial Rome. Here, in Dante, the prostitute is actually representing the church. That is uh, amoreggiante, he says, uh, e basciavasi insieme. She is together with a giant, and they are almost making love, they are kissing each other. This giant is the French uh, dynasty, the French king, and uh, all the political alliances and tricks uh, and uh, dirty maneuvers that the church, or at least some parts of the church, and the pope for sure, were doing in accord with uh, the French king. 
this prostitute then looks at Dante straight in his eyes and it's not very clear what this actually means. Um, many scholars disagree on what this means. The ferocious Amador beat her from head to foot. This, the majority of people think it's referring to the Anani episode where the Pope had been uh, uh, even physically assaulted. And uh, the following line where he says, uh, he untied the chariot-made monster, dragging it into the wood so that I could not see this. Untying it and dragging it out of the wood is uh, a representation of the move of the papacy from Rome to Avignon. This transfer, let's say physical transfer, that happened um, as uh, another problem on top of all the other problems. So it gets really dense, really difficult and uh, elaborate as even as an allegory. But uh, I hope that uh, this is at least uh, something that I could try to do to help you and also help myself understand this uh, incredibly mysterious canto that's very much based on, on John's Apocalypse. Thank you again very much for watching and thank you for your support. We'll talk again soon.